pattern recognition is something that um, that artificial intelligence has actually gotten quite capable uh, or quite good at. So, um, uh, you know, uh, some of you may have read the. Uh, it's called. It was an article called "The Great AI Awakening," which was in the New York Times Magazine in the fall, which talked about the differences that um, have been developed um, in the Google Translate model. Google Translate used to do this sort of very clunky sort of word by word translation thing. And now with the most common languages, so translations from English to French, Spanish, whatever, uh, it, it operates based on a neural network that allows it. It is actually machine learning, which is a less controversial term than artificial intelligence. So let's call it machine learning, uh, which is capable of actually identifying patterns and creating something much more like natural language. So it is, the companion there is natural language processing, which is part of the same neural network technology. But it's very interesting, the stuff it can't do, right? So, um, so the, the Google's, um, or Watson's neural network is actually very, very good at identifying, it can identify a cat pattern. It can even build a cat pattern out of little dots based on having seen zillions of cats on the internet over and over and over again. It has learned what a cat looks like, but you never know what it might struggle with, right? So it can't tell the difference between a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin. <laughs> so um, I just, I want to use that as a, back, um, as a background, and I think I won't keep it up forever just because it might be so distracting. Um, and I'll keep it up for a little while. Now, I, I think it's ironic that Freya and Patricia and I had to come all the way to Oshawa to discover such similarities in our approaches, and, and, um, and so that's fantastic, and I hope that this will be a fruitful beginning of a conversation. Now, I should say, I've been writing about financial innovation uh, for uh, a while, and, uh, and only recently um, really started thinking about innovation in law, and so this is a very new project for me. I am very early stage, and um, although I don't want to take an awful lot from the books of the tech folks, one thing I'm trying to take is this idea that you prototype something, you get feedback, you iterate, and so this is an early stage paper and I really do welcome any and all feedback. So um, I teach administrative law in that context, spend a lot of time thinking about, um, uh, you know, about what reasonableness looks like, as you must do when you're trying to teach administrative law in this country. Um, and, uh, and recently it struck me that that's maybe kind of a good way to, to, to enter into the conversation about what technology is doing vis-a-vis -vis justice. So, um, so I think administrative law is a good starting point. Now, of course, to be clear, the language is different, right? In, in administrative law, most of the time, on standard of review, the substantive review of agency decisions by courts, what we're looking at is the standard of review of reasonableness. Reasonableness is not the same thing as justice, obviously. Um, although reasonableness is a component of justice, um, and I think also when we're thinking about justice writ large, I think it would be a mistake not to think about administrative tribunals in particular, because they are the front end and the sharp end of justice for uh, you know probably the majority of Canadians when it, in terms of their actual engagement with the legal system. Um, also, administrative tribunals um, are maybe the kinds of environment that would be ripe for technological solutions because a lot of tribunals deal with volume problems, they deal with resourcing problems, they deal with um, a specific subject matter expertise which could potentially be codified into a, you know, a, a decision tree for example. Um, and I think administrative law is an interesting way to be thinking about um, justice and technology because administrative law has this explicit conversation embedded within the, the reasonableness, you know, uh, standard of review, which is really around um, reasons and the obligation to provide reasons and the need for reasons. Um, and I think that that is exactly um, the place where, uh, where, where there's a lot of room for thinking about um, you know, what technology might do to our thinking about reasons. Um, and it also helps us to think about uh, the word technology, right? So in administrative law, uh, when talking about whether or not a decision has fallen within the, is reasonable, the court looks at whether or not the decision falls within a region, reasonable range of outcomes, and it looks at whether or not the process is, I feel like you can all repeat this with me, right, justifiable, intelligible, and transparent. I think I've got the order wrong. Um, and so in, so in that context, there's this sort of bifurcation of outcomes and process. But in reality, of course, these are reflexive 
things. The process will inform the outcome, the outcome will inform the process, and both of them iterate together. Um, uh, and so, and, and really one is not as um, easily extricated from the other as you might think. And so when we talk about technologies of justice, that sounds like we're talking about process, right? A technology, we, when we think about how we use that word, we tend to think of it as, as a, a means to an end. Technology is not the end, technology is the process. But as with any other process, there are knock-on effects on the outcomes that we end up looking for, hoping for, and, deli and having delivered to us. So um, in this paper, there are three parts. The first one I'm just gonna briefly review um, a little bit of the uh, just outcomes versus just reasoning from the case law, um, and really trying to make the point that the reason why reasons matter in administrative law as in justice generally is because of this underlying idea of the eso ethos of justification, right, as being an underpinning for the legitimacy of, this, of the exercise of state power. Um, and why do we have this idea of the ethos of justification? Because of an idea, I think, primarily of respect for the individual as well as for the, for the um, administrative body, for the executive. Um, but it's really, embed it, it's really based on this very Dysonhousian idea of respect for the people who are before the tribunal. You show someone respect by giving them reasons. You see their full personhood and you are accountable to be to them, regardless of your outcome. You have to justify where you got there. So that's the, my first part of the paper. Paper, it's an overstatement to call it a paper at this point, but you know, let's, let's get there. Um, secondly, uh, then uh, to look at software-assisted human decision-making. So the idea of augmenting human decision-making through software. And then third, looking mu at, m at the much more fundamentally different algorithmic decision-making tools. Um, where, uh, where what we're looking at actually is a really fundamentally different kind of reasoning from what we as human beings might, um, might think it really is, is familiar. Um, and in the end I, end, I end up with two, I think, interconnected questions for which I don't have answers yet. Um, and the first one is, you know, what to do with software that can be enor enormously um, accurate in terms of predicting outcomes? Uh, in terms of understanding whether or not that is just, th those are, that is just. So, for, so Ben Allery, who I'll be talking about at Profit U of T, um, has also been involved in creating Blue Jane Legal, which is um, started out as a tax law software program, and now it has expanded into employment law as well. And I'll talk a little bit about Blue Jay, but, but Ben would say um, that machine learning and law tech, as, is, as embedded in Blue Jay, uh, is at the point now where it can predict judicial outcomes with a high degree of confidence, even while not engaging anything that looks like the kind of principled reasoning that humans might engage in. But he would say that good outcome, uh, good outcome predicting, no matter how achieved, can actually improve the legal system. It can make it more predictable, it can make it more cost effective for individuals, it can make it more consistent. Um, it can, I, you know, it can scan for biases. It can identify those outlier decisions, which may be the product of human, you know, bias or error, as, uh, um, and therefore unjust. So, if it's the case, this is my first big question. If it's the case that, um, you know, if if you can imagine a system that can achieve that kind of predictive power, does that make that system just? And my second question is. Um, looking at neural networks and how this kind of, you know, Chihuahua versus Blu-ray muffin um, pattern recognition operates, what counts as reasons for a computer? So if you imagine a, a system that operates based on this kind of pattern recognition, if we accept that, that you know, let, let, let's, for, let's suspend our, you know, our skepticism for a moment and let's imagine that there is such a system, um, can you sort of reverse engineer reasons out of um, a decision-making uh, structure like this? And if so, how do we feel about those reasons? So, um, so briefly then, uh, let me just go back to administrative law and just talk about this idea of um, you know, whether justice necessarily means just outcomes or just reasoning. So of course I have to talk about it in this context, in the, in the context of reasonableness. I think as we probably all know, or will, if you haven't taken admin law yet, you're a student, since Densmere in 2008, which is of course the leading test in administrative law and substantive review, 
the idea of a reasonable decision by a tribunal has been sort of articulated as being it's not a two-step but it is a, a you know double fa doubly faceted approach to reasonableness so on the one hand the court uh, it, well I'll just quote a court conducting a review for reasonableness inquires into the qualities that make a decision reasonable referring both to the both to the process of articulating the reasons and to outcomes so in judicial review reasonableness if I close that, what happens? There. Um, so, in judicial review, reasonableness is concerned mostly with the existence of, so here's on the process, justification, transparency, and intelligibility. Justification, meaning the decision is justifiable, you can explain why it is a, you know, a logical outflow of the facts and the law. Intelligibility, as in it's comprehensible, right? It's not arbitrary, it's not incoherent and transparency so there is enough of a reasoning process there that you can see how the decision maker got from the beginning you know from from the theory the, the facts at the beginning to the outcome and then secondly it's also concerned with whether the decision falls within a range of possible acceptable outcomes which are respect defensible in respect to the fact and the law facts and the law and then the court goes on to say we agree with David D David Dyson where he states that the concept of deference as respect this being respect for the tribunal um, requires of the courts not submission but a respectful attention to the decisions offered or which could be offered in support of a decision. Now Justice McLaughlin has talked about this ethos of justification and has also used David Dyson's work in that context. Um, her most famous speech dates from 98-99 uh, when she talked about the ethos of justification but it's continued to be an animating idea for her you know at least through well you know, I, I don't have the sense that it ever stopped being an animating principle for her. Um, and she described, but, but, in, but it, from the beginning, she's described this ethos of justification as part of the minimum moral content of law. Law meaning something more than just rules, right? R law meaning something that is legitimate. And legitimacy, of course, ties into all kinds of fundamental convictions around the rule of law, including the consent of the governed, um, and the idea that law should be transparent and predictable and so on. I uh, work by lots of folks in lots of places who talked about the rule of law, but for me personally, I think Mary Liston's work is very useful. My colleague Lawrence Austin and Adam Dodek have written a good, um, a good piece on this as well. So what the Chief Justice has said, as she then was, is, uh, quote, societies governed by the rule of law are marked by a certain ethos of justification. In a democratic society, this may well be the general characteristic of the rule of law, within which the more specific ideals are subsumed. So she thinks this idea of justification is really fundamental to the rule of law. Continuing the quote, where a society is marked by a culture of justification, an exercise of public power is only appropriate where it can be justified to citizens in terms of rationality and fairness. So that's how she explains justification, rationality and fairness. Okay, so good. The difficulty, of course, is um, that this is that, that the, the obligation to, to provide uh, meaningful, transparent, intelligible, and justifiable reasons by, uh, by administrative tribunals, many, you know, that many adjudicators on whom on which are not um, legally trained, has been tough. Right? So anecdotally, I think we can say with some confidence that, that it has produced an awful lot of anxiety and case law, case law around you know, what it is to actually write a good reason. Um, so of course there are the, you know, the BC CAT and the Canadian Council of Administrative Tribunals and lots of others now run regular courses on how to write good reasons because administrative tribunals have this new obligation to demonstrate justifi justification, intelligibility, and transparency, which is hard if you're not legally trained and you're not sort of steeped in what a court might see as, as, as um, those uh, criteria, as those indicia. Um, and of course, we've had several cases since Densmere that have um, risen to the Supreme Court of Canada where the content of reasonable reasons has been uh, evolving. And honestly, I would say that um, the, 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 what we have as, as a result of those cases are some somewhat muddled holdings as to when it's okay to have a set of imperfect reasons and for the court to sort of supplement them with its own 
you know, uh, filling in the gaps with its own extrapolations to try and turn a set of, you know, reasons into something that is justi justifiable, transparent, and intelligible. Um, so, the Alberta teachers in 2011, five minutes, holy cow, okay, I'm going to skip this. Okay, so, let's just say, harder to achieve in practice um, than it actually is in reality. Um, so, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to skip a couple of different things, but I just want to emphasize, I guess, that, that when we're comparing what, what algorithms do or what um, machine learning does, we need to make sure that we're comparing it to normal humans, not to some ideal of perf perfection, right? Now, um, I think there are ways in which, um, in which basic decision tree software can assist uh, decision makers to make better decisions. So, and this is not the same thing as just like tick box reasons, but you could imagine ways in which a decision making structure within um, an administrative tribunal could help a decision maker just make sure they've considered everything that's relevant, not considered stuff that isn't relevant, make sure that they've considered the case law. And in cases like Maple Lodge Farms here in, at the Federal Court of Appeal, Justice Stratus, or um, Agiarco, which is a United Kingdom Supreme Court decision from last year, there are, there are examples of this kind of sort of software-assisted decision-making um, uh, which have addressed problems like decision-making that is too sparse, um, human error, and you can sort of, you can see that that might actually be um, not such a terrible departure from our existing approaches to administrative law, right? So, so uh, we can incorporate this idea of decision of a software assisted human decision making, I think most likely, you know, subject to fettering doctrines and so on. I think we can incorporate that into our existing jurisprudence. It's probably not a huge leap. Now I wanna definitely recognize the black box concern, which Patricia and Freya raised, um, and which was raised as well this morning. Absolutely, we need to be worried about system design. We need to be worried about you know, how the system is built. We need to be worried about the, the opacity at that level in particular, right? So Eric Gerding and Ken Bamberger in the States have separately written some br brilliant articles about what happens when you um, subsume assumptions into code, right? And how that makes them effectively <coughs> invisible to the human actors and immune to human judgment. And, and, and absolutely, those are real concerns. Um, so I want to say, yes, all of that, very real, very serious, and those are the easy problems, is what I want to say. <laughs> um, that's just to be provocative. Um, what about uh, systems like our Blueberry Chihuahua system that can predict outcomes with a high degree of confidence based on their own learning and moving beyond the assumptions that the humans originally coded into the model? So we're talking about an entirely different way of making decisions that's not human, right? That machine, actual machine learning. How do we feel about that? Can we do that? Well, in fact, Blue Jay Legal does that, right? Um, so, um, and Ben Allery has recently written a couple of pieces, but his boldest one is called Legal Singularity. And it just, it's on SSRN as of a couple months ago. Um, and his argument really is um, the predictive capacity is, is certainly a benefit in terms of predictability and consistency, and um, it, it forces judges to be more rational. It's cheaper, right? Algorithms don't need to eat or sleep. They're not low blood sugar before lunch. They don't get grumpy and you know impose heavier sentences, all those things that humans do. Um, but he goes further than that. So he says, the growth of big data, AI, and machine learning will have effects that fundamentally change the way the law is made, learned, followed, and practiced. So because um, with greater predictive power, humans will be able to determine in advance what the outcome's likely to be. They'll have greater ex-ante access to the likely outcome in their case. Um, and, uh, uh, and it will be cheaper. There will be lower cost of producing information. And his complaint about the existing legal system is that it's always going to be incomplete, right? We have incomplete law coming from the legislature. The court's job is to interpret and apply that law, but in every situation, there's going to be a level of incompleteness there, right? There's going to be the application to your particular facts, consideration of your particular um, issues. And he says this is bad, right? And that what we can actually achieve by way of artificial intelligence is a complete system of law where there are no more unanswered questions. And as a result, um, he imagines a complex system of rules, which are all knowable in advance, 
and no more need for legal principles whatsoever. There's no more need for this sort of Dworkinian, you know, arguing from principles. This is quite the claim, right? And arguing, and I've talked to him about it, and he's, you know, he's very compelling when he talks about it. He's very thoughtful. So, yeah, I, I don't, you know, this is not a future that I aspire to myself, but it's certainly a, a, a thought-provoking one. Um, so he says this idea of time. Okay, all right. So anyway, um, okay. So let me just allude to my other question then. So, so do we want to live in a world where we have a, a complex set of legal rules where the answers to every question are known in advance, where we don't need principles, where we don't need that human agency? And if it's actually the case that that means more ex ante information, cheaper justice, no more human error, you know, how, how, how do we feel about that? And then the second part, which I know I can't get to right now, is, um, is how uh, these algorithmic systems reason. So there are some uh, scholars at the Oxford Internet Institute, I think it's called, who've just written a fascinating paper on counterfactual reasoning. So what they say is, for sure, there, you need to look inside the black box, right? You need to understand how these systems are built, what their assumptions are, and so on. That's actually really hard a lot of the time, and that may not be what individual people who are before a tribunal care about, right? What they care about is how the decision was reached in their particular case. And because the decisions are so complex, because there's so many factors that go into it, that, and, and because the system is what it is, it can't tell you what you know, what its principles were. It doesn't operate on the basis of principles, but it can, let me just read this, and then I know I'm really out of time. Um, oh, maybe, maybe I didn't, hang on. Um, yeah, so what they say is they, they off, they, what the computer, what the algorithm can do is offer a certain kind of explanation called an unconditional counterfactual explanation. So these counterfactual explanations describe the smallest change to the world that can be made to obtain a desirable income or to arrive at the closest possible world. So if you get rejected after a you know, mortgage application, the, the system would be able to come back to you and say, well, you know, you're, you're 30 years old if you were 31. We would have been able to give it to you. Or your income was $60,000 a year if it was 65. We would have been able to give it to you. And it wouldn't have been able to tell you you know, how your income correlates with your age, correlates with all the other criteria that went into this very complex decision it made, but it is able to tell you about, um, you know, what set of variables, the, the closest possible world you would have lived in where you would have gotten approved for your mortgage. And how do we feel about that as a series, of, as a system of reasons?